In this video, I want to talk about uniqueness of elements in a group. Because in the previous video, we had talked about how we can denote the identity as an E or as a one or something like that. But that's kind of putting the cart in front of the horse, isn't it? Well, how do we know there is the identity? Why isn't it like an identity? You know, in English, we use these articles to kind of specify like plurality a little bit, right? How do we know there is only one identity? When you look at the axioms of a group, it just says there exists an element that has such and such property. It doesn't say that that element is unique. It turns out that for a group, the identity element is unique. That is, there exists only one element that has the property that EG equals GE, which equals G for all elements of the group. The identity element is unique. Now, when one wants to prove that something's unique, typically what you do is you take two elements with that property and argue they actually have to be the same element. And so there's kind of like two ways you could do that. You could do a proof by contradiction and be like, uh, for the sake of contradiction, take elements E prime and E double prime. And if they are identities, they have to have the following property. G times E prime has to be G. And also E prime times G has to be G. I do both cases because in a group, we don't assume that it's commutative. Um, and then we take another element, E double prime, and assume that G times E double prime is equal to G, which is the same thing as E double prime times G. So we take two candidates of, of the identity so that we have these two candidates. We have two candidates for the identity. All right. And so we have two two elements that are going to act like an identity inside of this group. How do we know there's only one of them? Well, one argument could just be that for the sake of contradiction, suppose there's two of them and get a contradiction. I'm going to take a slightly different perspective here. I'm just going to take two of them. I'm not actually supposing they're distinct, but I'm going to show that they're in fact one and equal. Because they're identities, this element G that we're playing around here is arbitrary. This property holds for any G. In particular, I, uh, e prime is an identity for E double prime, and E double prime is an identity for E prime. So if you take this element and, and, and expound it upon it a little bit, right? E prime times E double prime. Well, if we think of, oh, E prime is an identity for E double prime, that means this should equal E double prime. But conversely, if we think that E double prime is acting as an identity on E prime, this gives you E prime. And so you can see then connecting them here that E prime is equal to E double prime, thus finishing the proof that two things are actually one and the same thing. If you did a proof by contradiction right now, you would have got a contradiction to our original assumption that they were actually distinct. And so because I'm just contradicting the original assumption, I don't really think there's a need for a proof by contradiction, but such a thing is still a valid argument. So we actually do get that there's one and only one identity inside of the group. We can do a similar thing for inverses, that when you look at the inverse axiom, it just says that for any element, there exists a inverse. But how do we know there's only one inverse? There could be multiple inverses, right? Well, the group axioms help us uh, figure this thing out here. And so I want you to be clear that when you look, going back to this proof of the identity here, all we used was that we had a two-sided identity, right? And so I want to make sort of like a comment here. We didn't even use the full-blown axioms of groups here. So if there exists a two-sided identity, this is true for any type of object, any type of algebraic object. If you have a two-sided identity, um, it is unique. Now, if you have only one-sided identities, eh, things can get a little bit more funky, which is why we required in the axiom that the identity be, would be two-sided. But let's get back to the idea of inverses. If G is any element in the group, then the inverse of G is unique. So to prove this, we're gonna take two candidates for an inverse. So we're gonna say G prime and G double prime are both inverses for G. What does it mean to be an inverse? Well, for the sake of G prime, it means that G times G prime and G prime times G is equal to the identity, which we'll call it E right here. And what does it mean for G double prime to be an inverse? It means that G times D double prime and D, G double prime times G is equal to E. And so what we have here by assumption is two candidates, two candidates for inverses, for, for the inverse of G, which like I said earlier, we will call the inverse G inverse, but at the moment there could be multiple ones, right? And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna consider the product, the product of, 
all three of these elements together. So if G is an inverse, or I should say if G prime and G double prime are inverses of G, they should act like inverses of that. So let's consider, I'm actually gonna start off with this point right here. Take G prime G and times it by G double prime, right? Well, if G double prime is the inverse of G, that means G, sorry, sorry, I said that, I, did, I mean, that's true, but I wanna say if G prime is the inverse of G, that means G prime times G is the identity. And the identity times anything will give you back the element. So this object right here is equal to D G double prime. But conversely, because we're in a group, we can reassociate, I can redo the parentheses and get G prime times G, G double prime right here. And so in this situation, if you take G times G double prime, since they're inverses, you'll get G prime E, which is equal to G prime. And so you see that these things are actually one and the same thing. Inverses are unique. Now this time, uh, we were using, of course, the inverse axiom to show existence here. Because uh, to be unique, unique means that you have at most one, but you also have at least one. The inverse axiom gives us that they're unique. Um, to use the inverse axiom, you have to have the identity axiom because the inverse axiom references the identity. So if no identity exists, the inverse axiom becomes null and void. But you can also see here that the associativity axiom was necessary. So to prove the uniqueness of inverses, we used all three group axioms, associativity, identity, um, and inverses. Now I wanna show you why is it so important that the inverses be unique? Why is it so important that the identities be unique? I'm gonna show you two very quick applications of the inverse element being unique. So we're gonna show uh, what's commonly referred to as the shoe sock principle. The shoe sock principle, why do I call it that? So if we have a group G, so G is a group, and elements G and H are elements in the group. We often will denote groups with capital Roman letters, and then the elements of the group will be lowercase Roman letters. Typically, we like to use capital G for generic groups, lowercase g for elements in said group. Uh, that's sort of convention we do. So, when it, so what the shoe sock principle has to do with is if we take the inverse of a product, so we take the inverse of G times H, this is actually equal to H inverse, G inverse. Notice how the order gets swapped around when you take the inverse. In general, groups do not demand any commutation on the operation here. The multiplication is not necessarily commutative, so the order matters. And so when you, when you take the inverse of a product, you reverse the order. And the principle is the following. In the morning, when you get ready for the day, you first put on your socks, and then you put on your shoes. So that's how you get ready for the day. On the other hand, when that's when you put them on, but when you take them off, the roles get reversed. You first take off your shoes and then you take off your socks. So the inverse operation switches the order of these procedures around. And that's what we're trying to claim right here. And this proof is basically just the uniqueness of the inverses. What we're gonna do is the following. We are gonna take G times H and I'm gonna multiply it by H inverse G inverse, like so. So we're gonna multiply these things together and I'm gonna prove that this is the identity. Well, because the group has an associative operation, we can redo parentheses. So we get H inverse times G inverse G times H, like so. But G inverse and G, they're, they're inverses of each other, so their product will give you the identity. All right, so we get the identity uh, EH right there. Well, EH times anything, each is gonna give you the element back, it's just the identity. So you get E inverse time, uh, H inverse times H, which as those are inverses, you get back here, the E. So I want you to be aware associativity was key in this discussion. Obviously for inverses, they must exist and you must have identities, but the associativity axiom was necessary so that we could redo parentheses at our leisure, right? So what we have now shown is that H inverse G inverse, when you times it by GH, gives you the identity. But wait a second. It should be that GH inverse times is by, multiplies by GH to give you dot, 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 dot. This should be the identity. Since inverses are unique, the only way that H inverse G inverse could act like an identity is because it is the identity. If your element walks like an identity, in quacks like an identity, then it has to be an identity because they're unique. 
In this situation, if your element walks like an inverse and quacks like an inverse, it must be an inverse because inverses are unique. The only way this element could give you the identity is it was the inverse, but look at it, it worked. It's an inverse and the other's direction works as well, right? So um, you see that I illustrated doing, which one did I do? Here in the proof, I wrote up here, GH times H inverse G inverse, right? I did the uh, other details. The thing is the two arguments are basically the same. You don't necessarily have to do both. I typically would say the other one is similar. So the uniqueness of the inverses shows us the shoe sock principle. Let's look at one other uh, corollary of the uniqueness of inverses here. Uh, so in any group, if you take an element G, the double inverse is the in, is the original element again. This again follows by inverse uniqueness, right? If you take G times G inverse, that gives you the identity because G inverse is the inverse of G. Same thing on the other direction. But wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Um, if I take G inverse, the only thing that should multiply by G inverse to give you the identity would be the inverse of G inverse. Right by construction, G inverse that's an element of the group, it should have an inverse element. But as G is already doing that, then uniqueness implies that G inverse inverse actually is the element again. So, the simple statement that inverses are unique can be a powerful tool to prove more uh, powerful theorems, propositions, corollaries about properties of groups.